Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. November 6, 2020, the world of hockey lost a great one. A Hall of Fame caliber defenseman whom time has most definitely forgotten. And now, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we're going to visit with his children, Dana, Darcy, and David, and the great captain of the New York Rangers, Vic Hadfield, as we take a look back at the life and career of a great one, Jim Nielsen. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shaped the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello, and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes, episode number 96, Jim Nielsen. For those of you who don't know who Jim Nielsen was, well, he was an absolutely terrific defenseman for the New York Rangers during the 1960s and early 1970s. Back on November 6th, 2020, unfortunately, we lost Nielsen. He was also known as the Chief. And today on Sports Forgotten Heroes, I welcome his children, Dana Nielsen, Darcy Wade, and David Nielsen to the podcast to talk about their dad. And also joining is another great from the New York Rangers, Vic Hadfield. Ironically, I was unable to contact Vic for a podcast I did about him a few years back, episode number 25, but he graciously agreed to appear on this episode of SFH to talk about his good friend. Vic was the captain of the Rangers, a 50-goal scorer, and when Nielsen joined the team for the 1962-63 season, a lifelong friendship was formed. A few notes that you need to be aware of for today's episode. Dana, Darcy, and David all live in different areas of Canada, as does Vic. And to get everyone together for this podcast, I recorded the entire episode on Zoom. Now, the cool thing about Zoom is you are able to separate audio channels. For those of you who know what that means, cool. For those of you who don't, No worries, but just know that when I edited this episode, it meant that I was able to isolate who was speaking and turn the audio channel off for those who weren't. So, I was able to limit any unnecessary background noise to a point. That is, with the exception of Darcy and Vic. As it turned out, Vic was unable to connect via Zoom. So, he was on the phone with Darcy, and she kindly placed the phone near her microphone so we could hear Vic. While his audio isn't the clearest, it is still quite understandable, and he had a lot of great commentary to add to SFH regarding Jim's career, the Rangers, the competition and the game, and of course, as you would expect, Jim's children all spoke so very reverently of their father and made a good case for why they think their father deserves to be in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Vic did as well. After listening to today's episode, I invite all of you to go to my website, sportsfh.com. There I have more on Jim and some more notes on why they think Jim should be inducted. Really good stuff. 
Oh, one other thing. Unplanned. I recorded this show on November 28th, 2020, three weeks after Jim had passed. And ironically, on what would have been his 80th birthday. So I feel somewhat grateful that I was able to provide an outlet for Jim's children to speak about their dad on what should have been a terrific day to celebrate. A few other notes before we get into today's show. Sports Forgotten Heroes is a member of the new Sports History Network. You can check it out at Sports historynetwork.com. It's a place where several of us who have sports history podcasts have come together under one umbrella for great content on the history of sports. It's pretty cool. Of course, I also encourage everyone to check out sportsfh.com. As I just mentioned, I have more information on Jim there. More information on all of the forgotten heroes whom I have featured, information on my guests, an archive of all my shows, and it has a comment section so you can ask questions, make comments, and even suggest forgotten heroes for me to research and to do a podcast about later on. Please follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at SportsFHeroes. Look for my Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook or follow on Instagram. Lastly, please, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, give Sports Forgotten Heroes a five-star rating. And as always, thanks for your support. Now, back to today's show and Jim Nielsen. So, who was Jim? Well... He was a stud defenseman, a guy who would stand you up at the blue line, a hard hitter, and a guy, as his daughter Darcy said, was so proud of his defensive skills that he took extra pride in his skills when his teammates Eddie Jacquemin and Gilles Villemure won the Vezina Trophy for the best goalies in the NHL in 1971. He took great pride pride in his game, and just might be one of those guys who, for no real reason, has been overlooked for the game's highest honor, induction into the Hall of Fame. So, let's get on with today's show with Dana, Darcy, David, and the great Vic Hadfield. I want to thank you all for being here, for being on Sports Forgotten Heroes. I think the way I would like to start this is with Vic and Jim's career, um, the two of your careers, they basically paralleled each other is the way I understand it. Um, you basically played for the Rangers at the same time with Vic joining the team, uh, with Jim joining the team one year after you did. So Vic on the ice, what were Jim's strengths um, what kind of game did he play? Well, he's, uh, first of all, he was just a great teammate. And, uh, and he, he certainly took the instructions well, um, you know, that was given to him. So you could see that he was, you know, he was a smart player, big, uh, a big young man. And um, uh, he could skate. He was a real good skater and, uh, and tough. He didn't always play tough. You know, by that, I mean, uh, you know, he never fought and all that stuff. But he was tough to play against. So we, we knew we had something uh, going pretty good when, uh, when Jimmy first came with us. Do you think he got the kind of recognition that he deserved? When I look back at his career, he struck me as someone who was very steady, you knew he'd score about six to eight goals a year, add about 25 assists a season, and he'd get his share of penalties. Not a lot, about 65 minutes or so a year, but he was steady. He was a rock. Did he get the recognition that he deserved? I think he did. Uh, I mean, as far as the, uh, you know, the rest of the players, I mean, they, we certainly appreciated uh, what he was doing. You're totally right. When he was steady, he came to play every night uh, and moved the puck well. And um, it was just a great teammate. We, uh, we, you know, we had a lot of respect for Jim.
Jimmy when he first came with us. Raj Bear once said that Jim defines defensemen as well as anyone who has ever played our game. What are your recollections of Jim on the ice, and how did he compare to his contemporaries? I'm talking about guys like Brad Park, who I think might have been his defensive partner, Carl Brewer, um, Jacques Lapierre, Tim Horton. I left out Bobby Orr because I guess that guy's sort of in a class by himself. But um, um, did how did he compare to to his contemporaries? Well, again, uh, you know, I repeat myself for the fact that he was a steady player, and uh, you know, we, he knew or we knew. Uh, that he was going to be playing, uh, you know, every minute of, it, of the game. He never took a shortcut. He uh, was very steady, moved the puck. And he could play tough in front of the net, uh, you know, because Jimmy was a big boy. And um, so that's what you're looking for as a team, teammate. And so we all we, we all stuck together, played as a team, and Jimmy was certainly part of that. Okay, guys, your father had a very unique upbringing, at least from how I read it. Um, can you talk about it and how unique it is to have been in an orphanage and make it all the way to the NHL? How does that happen? Uh, who wants to take this? <laughs> I, I, um, Darcy. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Darcy. Go ahead, Dana. Mm. Well, I think... Um, I, I think how does it happen? I, I mean, I guess we we look back now and it's it's pretty remarkable. Um, you know, it uh, uh, it's um, you know certainly not a, a likely path for anyone to to grow up in an orphanage and end up you know uh, you know at, um, you know playing professional hockey. Uh, um, I think Dad would say he was you know he just he just went out and played hockey I don't think he had this big plan you know that he was, was going to grow up and be in the NHL I think he just you know he just played a lot of hockey and and um I think um you know just uh, I guess he got noticed in junior hockey he played um uh he he always talks about um in junior when he played for the Prince Albert Mintos that he he was a forward and I guess there were some injuries and, and so they put him back on defense and that was like the, you know, that was like the turning point for him. I think he found his spot as a defenseman. And then, you know, in, in those years, they didn't draft players, I think. So the, the Rangers had the rights to the Prince Albert Mintos and he got noticed and he, yeah, I think he just went out and just played hockey and yeah, that's uh, it's different times, but he, he always felt like being annoyed, like he just was on the ice all the time. He got encouragement and um, from the, the nuns and in the, in, the, in the orphanage, and he just, yeah, uh, I don't know. Just Dana and David, do you want to step in at all? Well, just, just to sort of explain to everyone Dad's background. Of course, he he was born in Big River, Saskatchewan, um, and was in the orphanage from the age of five with both of his sisters. Um, his dad is Danish or was Danish and his mother uh, is a Cree um, indigenous person from Canada is the term now. Um, she um, remained on the Big River um, First Nation. And I think from a standpoint of both of dad's parents, they did what they did for the kids so they could have a better life. And the better life at the time was at the orphanage. Um, so you could get educated, you had a roof over your head, um, you were fed. And um, with that, uh, you know, from, from dad's perspective, the orphanage was also a good place for him. Um, we don't know and we'll never know if he had not been in the orphanage, um, whether he would have been an NHL player because he was able to start playing hockey and was very much supported by um, everyone at the orphanage. Um, one sister in particular, Sister Ignatius, she'd often, we, we've heard stories that she would take extra sandwiches to dad because she knew he, he was playing hockey, which is lovely. And in the summers, we would go back as kids when, when 
we would summer in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, um, and we'd um, visit the sisters because that, that was dad's, as far as we knew, his home, and these are the people who raised him. That's not to include either of his parents, of course. Well, why, why was he in an orphanage? What led to him being in an orphanage? Well, I, uh, well go I, ahead, Darcy. Go ahead. I think his um, his parents separated when I guess dad was really young and, and his mother went back. They, they, both of their parents were alive. She went back to the uh, to live in, in, in Big River the, with the First Nations. And then um, dad's father was a, a, a mink rancher. So we're looking like the 1940s in northern Saskatchewan. He just couldn't care for the kids, I think, was really. And he just felt that this was maybe the 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 best choice for the kids so they could get you know get go to like Dana said go to school you know be fed and and so that you know that was why they 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 yeah they don't think I think they would see um their dad sometimes in the summer um they would visit but I think as time went on maybe you know maybe less of that happened um but dad never complained like he just he he felt like he was treated well he he like he never felt like it was um it, it was never um like he he never complained about his upbringing really like he he felt it was you know he was treated well and he would the one one thing he would say that stands out in my mind as an adult and as we learned more about dad um you know in the last you know as we were adults is that he said they were hungry and that you know that that sometimes that, that bothered me a lot when I the first time he said that but it wasn't even complaining he just said sometimes they were hungry and um and he'd also said he couldn't he couldn't believe he still ate potatoes because he ate so many potatoes when he was growing up and he had to peel the potatoes for all the kids too like he had to actually work for his dinner <laughs> so <laughs> but you know how, how how proud of his heritage was he, uh, you know, Danish and Cree? And I guess I'm really talking more on the Cree side. How proud of his heritage was he? David, you want to take that? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, I think, uh, uh, like anyone, very, very proud of where you come from and your background and your ancestry, right? Like, it just, um, and not really being very open or talkative or saying a lot about it dad just it was more in his actions and the way he operated and the way he lived you know he was just um you know on the on the hockey rink and on the ice he let his uh play do the talking right and 60s 70s uh era that's a it's a tough era uh and Vic can you know attest to this you know you you handle things on the ice the way you needed to handle things right and so i think he never got too high he never got too low uh on and off the ice about uh you know racism and stereotyping and all that kind of stuff he just uh did what he had to do to to survive right and i kind of to answer your very first question how does someone get from the orphanage to the nhl right now it doesn't happen that doesn't happen right like it just did it, it's it didn't happen 30 years ago 40 years ago and it's just a very rare thing right so you know part of uh you know that being true to yourself and and where you come from and where you grow up and who you are you know is everything that takes you to where you where you got to right so um you know, so that's that's the way I kind of look at it, right? Like, uh, you know, you always more more will, more than willing to help out in whatever way was asked to, you know, and in, for Indigenous communities uh, during his playing season, playing hockey career and after, right? And so, um, but Dad's very humble too, right? Like he's not outspoken or brash or anything like that, so he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't. Uh, be too overt about it. He just, you know, he just knew the impact he made. Mm-hmm. Hey, Vic, this question is for you. Uh, when, when Jim joined the team, when he joined the Rangers, did he already have the nickname chief or was that something 
that he earned while he was with the team. Where did the nickname Chief come from? Well, I don't know. Maybe just more guessing that where it came from. I mean, we knew that uh, Jimmy was, uh, uh, you know, a Cree. Um, and I guess we felt comfortable enough, and, uh, you know, with, with Jimmy around that somebody just started calling him Chief, and uh, he answered to it, so... He was comfortable. We, we weren't uh, slamming him or anything. Uh, this was uh, a nickname, which a lot of the guys had uh, little nicknames. But, but Jimmy, uh, it was uh, you know he was proud of what the heritage is, and um, and that was good enough for us. We uh, we just uh, you know tremendous amount of respect for him because we did find out you know where you know he was from the orphanage and uh, and not that. Um, uh, you know, at this, I guess being in the orphanages was one that got him started to be able to play. And as the girl said that uh, he's, uh, uh, David, that he, uh, this is where he had the opportunity to be fed, had a roof over his head. And he certainly uh, respected uh, all that that was done for him and uh, all through his career and his life. Uh, I mean, always well respected by uh, by everybody mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. interestingly enough there was another uh uh person with an indigenous background who just passed away too i don't know if you know of him fred i i it's a hard name for me to pr- pronounce sasakamus 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 um did players like fred and jim ever face any sort of racism that you know of based on their heritage i know there were writers who might have used some colorful language to describe jib and to describe fred language and stuff that you would never attempt to get away with today i don't even know if the the nickname chief could even be used today vic did do you know of any sort of racism they faced on the ice during that period can't remember uh, it ever happening because uh, you know we as the rest of his teammates would never have put up for that so um but nobody has showed any disrespect to, to jimmy because he is uh, is a creed so we uh, we never ran into uh, uh, anything like that we stuck together as a team we played uh, played hard off the ice and on the ice we all gathered around uh, and had dinners and uh, and little get-togethers as a team, and Jimmy was right front and center. Mm -hmm. How about you, Dana, Darcy, David? Did your dad ever talk about anything like that? Did he ever have to face anything on the ice that you're aware of? Um, I'll just real quick. Every now and then he would say, uh, you know, a little bit about it, right? You know, uh, but that was the game within the game. I'm not sure that uh, he didn't hand it back too, you know, uh, you know, if there's the uh, odd, you know, negative comment or anything like that. Um, I don't think it was a lot to tell you the truth. Um, um, and, uh, I think the respect in the game and the, especially in the, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, after a while, when you have a lot of respect, I don't think, uh, and as Vic said, and it with, uh, compounded with a real tight knit group. It's not going to happen that much because you know that person can handle it and dish it out, you know, any which way it needs to be dished out, right? And so, uh, yeah, but I would think he never talked too, too much about it. But knowing what you, what I know about Freddie Sasakamus and dad, yeah, they would have experienced it for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in New York. I grew up just outside of New York City in Westchester County. And I used to go down to the city all the time. And it was a pretty intimidating place, especially when I was young. So I don't know if any of you can answer this. Did Jim ever talk about the culture shock of going from an orphanage, a small town to New York and going to play hockey for the New York Rangers? Did he ever talk about what that experience was like at first. And, and Vic, maybe you can relate to, to this the best. I mean, after all, you lived through part of that scenario too. Well, it's true. And we 
first went, I mean, I was 20 years old, and I'd never been to New York before, and so we were, we were flew down, and uh, just amazed at the uh, at the view of flying in on the plane, and then you kind of uh, you, you pinch yourself to see if you're uh, if you're still with it, and seeing the the amount of people, and but everybody uh, never had any problems. Uh, with uh, any of the crowds, uh, uh, they, they, they love, love the hockey. Um, but I, I always do remember walking from the hotel over to the old Madison Square Gardens and uh, just a massive you know, amount of people uh, all going somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, we all fit in, even though, I mean, I was born and raised in, in Oakville here. We probably had 16,000 people. <laughs> Uh, in, in this little town that I grew up in, and to go down now and see, geez, I'm in New York, and look at the people, and uh, and, the, and the fans were really good to us, even though we didn't have very good years at the beginning. Mm-hmm. They, uh, they stuck with us because they could see that we're at least trying. We're not going to win all the games, but as long as you're trying, they're going to be on your, you know, on your side. Jimmy fit right in. And the same as all the guys. We made sure everybody was comfortable. Everybody was not slipping away by themselves somewhere. There would always be five, six, seven guys going to have dinner or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did, did, he, did he ever talk to any of you about his initial reactions to playing in such a place? Well, we all, we all talked about it. You know, mm-hmm. geez, you see, uh, you know, somebody would walk down the street didn't have any clothes on. But, you know, he would look at uh, Geez, look at that. <laughs> didn't bother anybody else in the city. They just kept going. I remember, this would be a little funny thing. We had a, uh, a Halloween party at Joe Delamere's house. And um, he had to dress up, actually. I went as a ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> Had the blonde hair, the big boobs, work dress, uh, size 11 and a half high heels. <laughs> Walked about three blocks. <laughs> in the city, we're walking. <laughs> in Long Beach. Oh, in Long Beach, okay. <laughs> Still. Look at you. I mean, I had to stop and get a pack of cigarettes. And I looked in the mirror and I said, geez, I could take a run at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we are. We, we stuck together. And I, I can't uh, stress that enough. Uh, and Jimmy was certainly one of us and uh, had different backgrounds, naturally. But uh, uh, just a lot of respect. I just can't, uh, I can't say that enough. His game really picked up, I think, when you look at the numbers and you go back through his year-by-year stats, his game, I think, really picked up around the 67-68 season, and that's when the Rangers started to turn the corner. Um, It was the first time he ended up the season on the plus side. He was a plus 27. He was an all-star. One of two times he made the all-star team, and he finished fourth in the Norris Trophy voting. Can you all talk about the ev- or I guess this would be more for Vic? Can you talk about the evolution of his game? Those few years from 1967 through 1973, he really was a stalwart on the blue line. How did his game evolve? Well, the thing is, is that you know we started to get a better uh, hockey club um, together, and, and, and those dates that you uh, gave me. And, um, but, I mean, he started right from the beginning. He, we knew he was uh, a tremendous skater. And I think he gained confidence, the same as all uh, you know, the rest of the young guys. We looked, you know, when you look down the bench, and, you know, we had some pretty good players there. Sure. And, uh, and Jimmy was certainly one of them. And I think he gained more confidence in handling the puck. Um, you know, he knew he was a New York Ranger, very proud. And, um, uh, developed that way. He was a you know a great teammate to uh, to have on your side, um, and uh, that, that's basically it. I want to know what it's like growing up with a father 
who is a star athlete, were you able to appreciate it when you were younger? Did you know, or was it more like dad's a hockey player and that's just his job? I mean, what is the mentality in your household? He's gone, you know, how many months a year and then he shows back up. What was it like growing up with a father who's a star player in a professional sport like the National Hockey League? Well, uh, from my perspective, Warren, I, I, I think it was, um, that was his job. Um, and this sort of goes back to your question about from orphanage to New York City. Dad never said much to me at all about, holy smokes, you know, from orphanage to New York City, but he really took so much in stride and I think what he would also say is he, he's talked about how um, he and my, our, our mother married, I think, in 1962. And I think that that for him really helped to sort of uh, have that uh, to, to start him on his path, I guess, in, in, in a way in New York City. And what I remember about New York City is the the Ranger family is is what I would call it, and that still exists today. Um, I, I've had text messages from Audrey Audrey McGregor today because it's it's Dad's birthday. So I, I remember um, spending time with kids of the other Rangers. Sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I hear you. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, actually Vic's kids. Um, we we all lived really close together in Long Beach. Um, all that we all went to school, and we, we all the players in my memory and their families all lived like we lived out in Long Beach and not a big community, um, you know. So we we I remember the Jockmans lived behind the block behind us. Vic, where were you guys? We were on Trenton Avenue. I forget. You guys were close, so I know in walk, probably walking distance. <laughs> Well, you should because you're always over at my place eating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've known Vic's kids like my whole life, basically, and and and, and Dane and David too, and um, Rattel's kids. Like we all, so it was a, definitely a, a Ranger family for sure. That we, you know, everyone was really close knit. Like the players and the, the, I think all the the wives hang out, the kids hung out. We went to practices. I remember when uh, the team, uh, I guess when we could, um, we would go to Saturday morning practices and, and, and that was, that was really fun. But Dana, I think what Dana said about, you know, your dad being a, a hockey player, we, um, yeah, that it was his job. I mean, I think we thought it was kind of cool because we, when we could go to the hockey games and we could go to practice and stuff, but it was just, it wasn't, you know, you know, dad was very humble and we didn't like, it wasn't like, it wasn't a big deal, I guess, but, you know, I guess looking back at it now, you know, you're like, wow, that was pretty cool. <laughs> so, but yeah, I would was, think, yeah, you know, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. I think too, that uh, some of the stuff in small town Saskatchewan that happened in the off season, you know, I, I have people that I hang out with and know to this day that would come up to me and say, yeah, I knocked on your door, to get your dad's autograph in the summer. And, uh, you know, this is in the summer, just people doing random things like that. And I don't remember it. I was probably too young and about that to remember that. Maybe Dana and Darcy did, but it was just those kind of things would happen. And and uh, we never I, like just took it in stride. And it was always it was pretty cool and and never really. You know, I remember I used to have when dad played with Gretzky at the end of his career, I used to we used to have all the, the, the sticks from the Oilers, including a lot of Gretzky sticks. Right. But I would use them for road hockey and ruin them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I could have been sitting on a pile of money right now, but, uh, you know, you, you, know, you never really thought of it. Right? Mm -hmm. and I, I think, Warren, the, the reason we never thought of it also was um, we're a bit like our father that way. He was always very unassuming and humble. And I think we, we all took our cues from him. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that that's really interesting. What was your dad like at home? Um, was he a quiet, was he quiet? Um, 
did he tell dad jokes? Like my kids tell me, oh, dad, that's another terrible dad joke you're telling. The, you're annoying me. Um, was he serious? Was he a practical joke? Or what was he like? Hi, Scarlett. A little bit of all that. <laughs> <laughs> he was a typical dad and he would have, he, um, yeah, he's, I mean, dad's a quiet guy in, in general, but he, he was very, um, he was, he was funny. I think, you know, a, a lot of the things that we've been hearing from all over, he was, he had a really good sense of humor. So he was, he was, you know, he would, he would joke around the stories he would talk about would be, you know, like funny stories that he'd be talking about things that, you know, happen that, that the rink or whatever, but it'd always be about jokes and stuff like that. Those would be the things that he'd, so he'd be laughing and telling us stuff like that. And, um, but yeah, like he was, he, he was, um, you know, he'd, he'd tell the dad jokes, but we, you know, he was just a, you know, he, he was, he was, he was, he was there for you. He was, you know, he was, you know, he was always there. And, uh, you know, it was different, the travel schedule, I guess, in the winter, they would, you know, the players would be gone for a while. Dad wouldn't be home for a bit, but he'd come home. But when he was home, he was home, right? Because of the type of job you have, he wasn't nine to five. So, you know, he, uh, you know, he taught us a lot. He taught us, you know, and um, yeah, he, I think some of the stories were really, uh, you know, hard to imagine. And, you know, with all the stuff that would happen with, you know, people coming to your house, just randoms and asking for autographs. And then he'd tell these long stories, at least to me. I don't know if he told them to Dana and Darcy about, you know, you know, practical jokes that I, I would, I wouldn't be not sure if they were real or not real. That's till, true. Like, you know, yeah. finally <laughs> a little bit older. Right. Like he never, he never really end the yeah. story. Like it was just like the time he told me that he got his slap shot was too hard for the NHL and, and they banned it because uh, he took one and, and it went through the net at Madison square garden and through the boards and hit an old lady in the knees. So <laughs> NHL couldn't have that. And uh, they just said, you know, you just passing only now. And um <laughs> <laughs> and uh that's just one of them right and though uh, and, and you're young and impressionable and then you see all these other stuff happening and like well could it be true well <laughs> you know? he did that a lot with david david's five years younger so a, a lot of it we were pretty sure david that it wasn't true but but we enjoyed him telling you these stories <laughs> yeah <laughs> what was it what, what was it like to go to the garden to watch Vic play, to watch Jean Rattel play, to ro watch Raj Albert, to watch your father, to know that your father is down on the ice with the greatest players in the game, and he was one of them. What was that like? Well, we, I guess we... Um, I don't remember you know, I was it, born. It, it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, David was pretty young when we lived in New York. I was, I'm the oldest, so I was, you know, when I got to be like eight, nine, ten, I think I was able to go to games. Like I couldn't go on a school night, but, you know, on they used the Rangers, I used to have Sunday afternoon games. And I think that was, that's when we were allowed to go. And, uh, and it was, it was, it was good. It was, you know, it was, it was, I don't know. I think it was back to, that was dad's job. It was like, kind of like, you know, it, we just kind of went because, you know, to watch him play. And um, but what I do remember sometimes is in the warm up, I would go down closer to ice level and, and I know dad could see me. And so I would be watching and he would shoot the puck at the glass where I was standing to kind of so like he, as a joke, like you'd be laughing. <laughs> and uh, yeah. what I remember is it was um, um, very important did go to a game it was it was a very big deal when we were younger kids and we would have to be dressed up because it was almost like going to church and I, I remember my mom of course with the other wives always getting ready for a game and you know it, it was you know the respect you would show because your dad was a professional hockey player and um, the importance of that, I remember, I, and um, New York, I don't have a great memory of. I do have a, a memory of later years and certainly playing in uh, Edmonton and, and 
going to the games there um, was was wonderful because you got to know more about hockey and paid more attention to um, the game. Yeah, yeah. When we were older, I think we got to go to all the games, I think, yeah, in like Edmonton and stuff, yeah, and and maybe Cleveland, yeah. Oh, Cleveland, the old Cleveland Baron. Yeah. <laughs> must, have been, must have been a very unique yeah. experience going from, yeah. from Madison Square Garden, I guess, to the Richfield Coliseum. The the size of the crowds must have been a, a, a quite the difference. Very much so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd love an answer to this question from two different perspectives and and Vic you have your perspective and Dana Darcy and and David I'm I'm sure you have a a a perspective on this as well when a season is over and the player arrives home from from again from the two different perspectives what is it like for dad to come home? Is dad relaxed or does it take him some time to wind down? And from the player's perspective, Vic, when the season does come to an end and you do go home, is there an adjustment period? How long does it take to readjust to being at home and not going to the rink? Well, he, he, uh... In the 60s, that's what we, you know, we played, uh, uh, we kept starting, you know, Jimmy included. It was, uh, we didn't have a very good team. And so we, you know, we always used to fight for fifth and sixth place on the 16th league. And, um, you know, you're disappointed at the end of the year. You're, you know, you're leaving your teammates. And, uh, but, uh, and, you know, in the 60s, uh, we all didn't make a tremendous amount of money. Uh, we all had to go home and work. I remember getting beat out our last game, say it on a Sunday. We'd pack up uh, the kids on Monday and then drive home. I'd start work on Wednesday. And that's how I, uh, you know, got started in the golf business at, at that age. But we all, you know, respected the opportunity to play. Uh, I remember the first contract I signed and, um, it was, I think it was $7,500. Wow. But I bought a, uh, I bought a, uh, a Pontiac Strato cheese. $600. Brett, <laughs> <laughs> as we were talking, and we all lived on the uh, Long Island. Yeah. We rented a uh-huh. three-bedroom, furnished, completely furnished, uh, all utilities, for $115 a month, and you're a block off the ocean. Yeah. Wow. That's something. You go home and you save money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't look forward to it. Um, you know, this is something that I've chosen to say. That, you know, Jimmy would say the same thing. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to play. I'm going to be, uh, uh, you know, playing the National Hockey League. But back then, too. If you were 30 years old, and here's Jimmy and I are in the year 19 and 20, and, uh, you know, by the time you're 30 years old, you better be ready to uh, do something else because that's you know that's the age where you're you know you're not going to be able to play anymore. So I'm thinking, oh, 30, I'm 20 now, but and, uh, it sure got you ready for the next year. And uh, you know, did you you were embarrassed because you never made the playoffs. And then, uh, you know, 64, 65, we started to put a, you know, a pretty good hockey club together. And, uh, uh, and just, and, you know, winning, I guess, drove us to, uh, to do the best you possibly can. Again, stand together as a team. In the summertime, we were always in touch with everybody. Uh, I do that today. Uh, there's about eight or ten guys. I'm constantly involved with, you know, new families situations and um you never forget those times sure sure darcy i guess i guess you might have maybe the best recollection um from what i'm gathering you might be the oldest um what was it like when um dad would come home after the season was over was there an adjustment period and what did he do during the off season 
Well, he, um, he when I, get, I think probably till maybe, I don't know, say the late 60s, 1970, he was like, Vic, he, he had to go home and, and get a summer job. So he, um, I, I think he worked at a sod farm. He worked at a few, he had a few different jobs in the summer. So he did that initially. And then um, I think dad, um, he, you know, enjoyed the summer too. We, we, my, we, dad was, grew up in Saskatchewan. So we had a family summer home in Prince Albert where he was from and it's um it's a beautiful uh, it I know most people would be surprised to hear that but it is really nice there the summers are great there are lots of lakes <laughs> dad would play golf and and we, he loved fishing so he you know any of you know lots of lots of friends there so I think he um you know um when the rangers started to do better and and you know have a, a a long playoff run he certainly um you know he, you know obviously that was uh something that you know they wanted to keep keep going as long as possible and, and um but i think when when the season was done um and you know it was you know his his time in the summers and time off where he could you know, go back to Saskatchewan and, and do some other, you know, and play golf and enjoy his friends up uh, in Saskatchewan. And, and, uh, and we all enjoyed it as kids too. We, 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 we like going kind of back and forth and doing that, but um, yeah, I, I don't remember it being a big adjustment. I do, I do remember, I think Vic Crook, I, I might get the years wrong, 71, 70, 71, maybe when the Rangers went to the finals, I, I remember that being, a disappointment for sure that, you know, that they, I don't think they, they didn't win the cup that year. Um, and I, I do remember disappointment there for sure, but they, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, I think he, yeah, I think he, you know, it, it wasn't a big adjustment. I don't think really like it was, yeah. Like dad was like everything in stride, right? Like it was just, you know, he was pretty, pretty even keeled all along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he seems like uh, he was a very easygoing person. Um, in the interviews that I that I watched of him during uh, uh, my research period for this podcast, and in fact, during my research period for this podcast, Vic, this is a tough one. I saw a tweet where over five hundred Rangers Ranger fans responded. It was a poll asking. Do you know who Jim Nielsen was? 60% said no. So is it possible that the Rangers are somewhat to blame for Jim's lack of notoriety? And is there anything the team can do to help bring his name back into prominence to help in the mission to get Jim more recognition and maybe even possibly inducted into the hall of fame. I think the Rangers have, uh, have, uh, have done uh, a tremendous uh, amount of service to the, uh, you know, the alumni. Uh, they look at, they make sure that the guys are looked after. Um, uh, you know, I agree with you on the, uh, the hall of fame. Um, Subject with uh, with Jim, he certainly has the uh, you know the record uh, to to be there, and hopefully one day they will uh, uh, you know place him in there. But you know if you're not you know like now I don't go back to New York, uh, so if you're not there, you're you know you're not gonna nobody's gonna be there with you know reporting that you're there and, and going to the games and all that stuff. There's only two or three guys that live in New York. All these years, uh, um, you know, this is the plan. So it's, um, as far as the team doing anything more, I don't think we could really, you know, you couldn't ask for anything better than what they have done. Like I say, they make sure that everybody's looked after. Uh, uh, you know, if you want to do, you know, be down there in the, uh, in the summertime, they would certainly look after you, get you a hotel, get you know, theater tickets, whatever you wanted. They were there to help the, uh, you know, with, especially with the, with the Neil Francis, uh, you know, Glenn there and now, uh, you know, John Davidson. They're all the same. They, they look after 
speaking of players. I think that there are there are several people, of course, everybody on this Zoom call included, who think that Jim is deserving of an induction into the Hockey Hall of Fame. What do you think is keeping him out? It, it's, it, it, it's a difficult question, Warren, and, and I think part of the reason it's difficult is um, you don't know what happens. Um, you don't know who is even um, uh, selected um, to be put forth as a candidate because it's only members of the Hall of Fame committee who can do that. So you may know the three of us have put together packages for three years now, um, but doing that, it's a public submission. So from there, we don't know if dad's name is then put forth by any of the members of the selection committee. So that's challenging, uh, a challenging question to um, answer. Um, it, um, sometimes you think, is it because he played so long ago? Um, that may be, but, but for us, um, we, we've always been guided by a family friend who said, we should honor people when you still can. So the length of time doesn't matter to us, um, but I don't know the reason um, why that hasn't happened. It should be difficult to get into the Hall of Fame. Absolutely, we know that. Um, it's, it's an elite um, category of player. We certainly think our dad is there. And the thing is too, um, uh, you know, when we played in the, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, um, especially when there was, you know, just six teams. Mm -hmm. And then now today we have 30 and we have a lot of European players. So if you're not in the hall, say five years after you've uh, retired, the, the chances to make it more difficult because of the number of players. I mean, there's thousands of players now. And then there's a lot of players, and I know uh, we've talked about this before in uh, you know, private conversations type, where there's a lot of players that should be there. They've been on Stanley Cup. Uh, yeah. Bobby Nevin, we just lost him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he won two Stanley Cups, mm -hmm. and they've ignored Bobby. Uh, and there's you go down through the list, and you know, geez, how come that guy's not in the Hall of Fame? It seems to uh, slip by. I mean, the selection committee uh, it seems to me that they change it almost every year. Not totally, but three or four new uh, people in there. They probably never even seen Jim play. <laughs> That's and true. Not up front and center in the newspaper, and. Uh, just seem to ignore you at the point. But I, I wouldn't really put a lot of uh, thought into it because we as players knew what Jimmy was capable of doing. I, I, was, I was never on a Stanley Cup uh, winning team, and neither was, uh, neither was Jim. Mm -hmm. It didn't stop me from doing what I do. I, I love doing charity work. Mm -hmm. um, I love the opportunity to call the different players up, uh, you know, health-wise. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, I mean, uh, what is there? Thirty teams now, where they got twenty guys on, uh, on each team. That's a lot of players. Yeah. Over, you know, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years. Um, that, that amounts to do the math. And but uh, he's an all-star in, in my mind. My thoughts. Uh, just uh, it's a privilege to, to have the opportunity to know Jimmy as a person and to be a teammate. And uh, good enough for me. <laughs> and, and for a little while, you were his opponent. After the 73-74 season, both of you saw your days with the Rangers come to an end. You went on to play, I believe it was for the Penguins, and Jim went out west to play for the California Golden Seals. As an opponent, what do you recall about his game? How tough was he? How tough was it to play against Jim? Well, I mean, we knew how tough 
he was. He, I mean, he was too much fun to, you know, to uh, practice even. Uh, he was uh, he was always there. He was uh, typical. I used to tease him all the time. Was, no. <laughs> that surprises me, Vic. <laughs> you know, Jimmy, uh, you're looking at my number all the time because he's chasing me. <laughs> That's where I had him. <laughs> and uh, he'd get a big smile on his face, and uh, I'd end up tripping him or do something, and <laughs> tell him I'm going to get him. And the <laughs> 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 guy he was, and uh, he'll always be remembered uh, as just a uh, just a great person. Did your dad ever talk about those days when he left the Rangers and went on to play for California and then later Cleveland? Um, you know, the, the differences between playing in New York and playing, um, you know, I guess it was Oakland and then Cleveland. Uh, did he ever talk about that and, and how the game changed for him? I think what the only thing I recall that changed for him was um, the injury he had when he played with the California Golden Seals. And um, it, it changed in terms of his skating ability from what I understand. But um, California, he was certainly a veteran presence there. Um, we, we loved um, California. We loved living in California. And it was just... A, a different team. So I remember Al McAdam, they lived down the street from us. So young, younger players for sure, but we're still in touch with McAdams. They're in Prince Edward Island. So it, it, it was a different team unit, not quite the length of, of, of the Ranger nucleus, but um, we loved living there and we lived beside some wonderful people in the non-hockey world. Um, so I don't, I, I think it was, yeah, a different team and they, they weren't quite as good as the Rangers and there weren't that <laughs> many fans, but if you go online, I think there's still a California Golden Seals fan club. There is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is. Yeah. I, I um, believe it. They had a, you know, for as short of an existence as they had, they certainly had a heck of a following. And by the way, when your dad went there, he went there with a great deal of respect. If I recall, he was actually the captain of the team. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I think he 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 understood what his role was with the you know with with such a young team. You know, he was the the veteran, and and uh, you know he kind of um, you know just sort of you know led by example but yeah he 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 was the captain there yeah so he, oh, he was the captain there because of his age too yeah yeah you know, he was, uh, that's uh, true yeah had the experience and uh, he knew, you know what it took but again you, you know, you're going to california and uh, excuse me uh it was, that's not long beach long island mm -hmm. All no. the, you know two or three blocks of each other out there, I think the guys were all over the place. So you, you're not going to get the guys together and the family as much as uh, we had there in New York. It's a unique uh, opportunity uh, living there and, and, uh, and having the connection with the family. That was very important. Yeah. 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 How difficult was it to leave there and go to Cleveland? And I don't recall, Vic, if you ever got a chance to play in Cleveland against the Barons, but I'm sure it was certainly a unique experience. What was it like to leave California and, and head to Cleveland and play there? I still don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, that David, that's when your love of NHL goalies started though. You don't remember you'd go to games and David would know if a goalie had changed his tape from one game to the next. <laughs> um, so uh, well, we I was fascinated by uh, the mass back in the seventies. I remember that like uh, the goalie in Cleveland, uh, uh, Smith, Gary Smith or something like that. He was nicknamed, he was nicknamed the Cobra. And so he had a really cool mask and that's, that was part of my attraction to, you know, obviously hockey and goalies and just whatever it was my initial reaction to it. And 
and then, uh, but yeah, Cleveland, uh, I didn't know any different. It was just uh, going to the game, watching them when we could, when I could, <laughs> uh, which was probably not very often, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know the odd time i was allowed to go to the game uh practice on the on the weekends and then skate right uh, or get on the ice uh before or after practice right uh that was the that was the treat yeah but you also had white skates on the way you were going to skate. <laughs> what did he say he said you had white skates <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and, and it was the same franchise if i'm if i if yes the, the moved to Cleveland and um, I think it was George Gunn who owned the team. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, it was the same franchise. You're just going to a different location. So back then, uh, you know, we weren't thinking, I don't want to leave California because it's so beautiful. Um, it, it was, yeah, it, it, it was just part of here's where we're going to be next season. And uh, we also, I have very fond memories of, of living in Cleveland. And again, at that time, remembering a bit more about going to the games. And I remember, you know, before a game, it must have been after Bobby Orr retired, I saw mom talking to him and they were just sitting in the stands and I walked over and mom said, well, this is Mr. Orr. And and when I look back now, I'm thinking, I met him. It had I, <laughs> if I met him now, I'd like, wow, you know, you're Bobby Orr. But at the time, it's like, oh, nice to meet you, Mr. Orr. Mom, can I go, you know, get this or that? So it, um, I think what what we're sort of saying, Warren, is it, it, it was a different league at the time. Um, and wherever we were, um, it we, we felt part of the team family. And that's probably what we remember more than the hockey. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. If any of you had the opportunity to sit in front of the people who vote for the Hockey Hall of Fame, what would you say to them as far as why your dad, Jim Nielsen, or your friend, Vic, Jim Nielsen, deserves to be enshrined? Well, you're not going to have that opportunity to, to uh, sit there in front of the selection committee. Um, uh, so, you know, you can hurry up about that. And I don't know how you would go about it now. I mean, I know the girls and David uh, was part of that, too. Um, reached out to the, uh, to the Hall of Fame. Now, there's, there's no reason why he shouldn't be in there. That's for sure. I mean, his record speaks for itself. Not just as a hockey player, but as, as a person too. Those are the kind of people you want to see at the Hall of Fame. Hopefully, uh, you know, uh, give somebody a hand a shake and uh, and find out why it, you know, uh, you know, my dad there. Um, it's all up to, uh, and I don't know, I, I sh maybe shouldn't say it, but I think it's uh, um, these people that, <laughs> excuse me, that are on that. I'm sure there's some qualified people, but I don't think they're all hockey experts and, uh, you know, for, for, you know, young enough to, you know, to remember Jimmy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a hard uh, thing to do. And I think the girls did, David, too, when they, uh, when they did reach out to the Hockey Hall of Fame, but they haven't done anything. It was, what, now three, four years? Yeah, three years. Yeah. Yeah. Three years. Yeah. So you wonder where they're, you know, what they're thinking about. And like I say, there's so many, uh, and I'm not the game the ladies, but there's, there's uh, ladies in, in the, uh, you know, the Hall of Fame. A lot of Europeans um, that, uh, that are back home and, and in the UK somewhere. Yeah. But around here. I think the process is a little bit political as well. And, uh, um, yeah. but, but our, our whole basis on this is not only his hockey career and his comparables, like, uh, you know, Rod Langway, he's in there. Right. And that was a basis as our, our comparisons, dad stats are right there, maybe even better based on his longevity. What holds him back a little bit is not having a Stanley cup. Uh, 
and being that defensive defenseman, you look at this process now, you know, as Vic said, you know, it's like five, six years out of the NHL, it gets harder and it's, you're looking at that, those high flyers, those offensive things, that stuff, you know, you really got to be looking at uh, the, the fundamentals of the game, the whole game, when you look at dad's career and his, the way he played the game. But then on top of it is your original question right off the bat, who comes from an orphanage and doesn't play minor hockey and then winds up being a runner up to Bobby or, uh, I don't know, like eight years after being out of an orphanage. That's, that's, that's the, you know, the, the things that we're kind of, you know, maybe you should look a little bit like at, at that, right. Look at, look at some of the, the impact and the influence and, you know, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I heard Don Cherry talk about dad and doing a podcast and, you know, after he passed and talking about his career and in, in, in this day and age, the way he played with the way he skated and smart and, be able to handle himself you know he's an eight million dollar man in this game this uh, right now right so uh that's uh and i know he can't look at it that way right but uh uh as far as hall of fame is concerned but you know those are the things that we're 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 basing this submission on right and and uh we'll see well and i i guess what i david speaks very well in, in terms of where we're coming from but Judging from the last three weeks and the people who have reached out to us, um, contacted us, sent us information about dad, the fan mail that dad received uh, decades after he played, um, it, it's unbelievable to us and quite overwhelming um, to see people that do remember him years after the fact, whether it be journalists from New York who've reached out. We, we had uh, a fellow who contacted me after he heard we were trying to uh, get dad inducted. And 24 hours later, I had a letter from him. He had season tickets with the Rangers. He said after dad was traded, he canceled his season tickets. Wow. Um, but he he gets in touch with me from time to time. He wrote a wonderful letter for us, you know, um, unsolicited. And, and that's just one of many, Warren. So uh, if, you know, uh, since dad's passing, it, it's, we thank each and every person who's reached out to us, whether it's a professional athlete, someone who played with dad, someone who watched dad, or someone who has heard about his story and written to him, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's really it's meant a lot to all of to us very much. We we've been kind of overwhelmed with all the the response and it's just the the, the impact we feel. You know, um, Dad made you know from near and far, and and it's not just his hockey career. I think just you know his his life story is um, you know it's it's you know, we've heard that he's, he's inspired people, you know, and, and we've read some beautiful letters and, and it's just, it's, um, it's been, it was, it's been, it's been wonderful for us. It's really warmed our hearts for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't think there's a single person in the hall of fame who um, you can compare to, to dad in terms of where he came from to touch on what David said. Well, when we sum it all up, how should your father, Jim Nielsen, be remembered? What is his legacy as far as being a hockey player is concerned? Um, as a hockey player, you know, uh, I think what you kind of heard from Vic here, you know what I mean? In summary, uh, you know, one of those ultimate teammates, right? Uh, he played with them uh, in, 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 you know, the, the good old years, right? And uh, when they came in struggling and then the team – slowly got better and playing better and you know so that ultimate you know that that teammate thing there you know like uh and you know when you get down to the to the you know fundamentals of the way he played you know like you know uh, it's his uh 
kind of like the way he he operated in life he was never assuming but effective right you know that all that that very steady reliable defensive defenseman that could probably you know i don't think it's out of line to say he could play in any era Mm -hmm. and not any not every hockey player can say that right you know um when you look the way you know they played a dad played it there's a spot for him on any team in any era Mm -hmm. right and so uh not overly flashy at all but very effective right and so uh and you know played the right way you know on the ice and off the ice you know he's uh around these parts that people really knew him is very humble very unassuming and uh you know, didn't really, it was more a team thing versus an individual thing. Right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think, I think, um, and this would be dad's words, um, that he, um, you know, like the, the year, um, that the Ranger goalies, um, Eddie Jockman and Jill Villamere won the Vezina as the, 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 the two of them won it together. Like that would be one of the, the highlights of his career as a defenseman to that he, you know, that, that his goalies, like um won the Vezina like that was you know it's such you know like he's so proud of that and so he yeah I think he um you know I, I think he just you know he went out and did his job he I saw another a quote it was actually Jill Spillamere and said that Jimmy Nielsen was a goal t- a goaltender's best friend well that's you know like he 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 was effective and he was steady and reliable and just, I think someone that, you know, his teammates, you know, really counted on day in and day out <laughs> to do his job well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we as players uh, on the same team as Jimmy's, as I indicated earlier, that uh, we all uh, had a tremendous amount of respect for uh, for Jimmy, the way he played, the way he carried himself off the ice, and good with the fans and the kids. So we knew what type of person uh, you know, Jimmy was, and uh, again, um, he, uh, his record speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. And it's you know we're going to have to get lucky here, I guess, and, and to get him into the hall. And I, I don't have any other ideas um, uh, on how you go about. It. But you know the kids have done so far, and you know you would think that they would recognize the fact, look up his record and, and look what he was all about. And, um, and again, there's so many players out there, um, you know, back in the sixties when we played, when Jimmy first came up, there was only six teams mm-hmm. and each team carried five defensemen. So there you're looking at the, the 30 defensemen that are playing in the national hockey league. There's 30 defensemen. Uh, today, they uh, you know they carry five, six defensemen on, on thirty teams. Um, it's going to be uh, you know very difficult to get in unless you're an outstanding uh, offensive player. Um, you know it's going to be harder as as they go along. So we just have to get lucky. I I think the common theme you we've been hearing and. Um, what Vic just mentioned, Warren, was he was respected um, by all on the ice, whether you played with him or played against him. Um, I, I got an email the other day from, I don't know how many players were included on it over many decades to reach out to our family to say how sorry they were to hear, hear of dad's passing, but they wanted it known how much uh, dad was respected, um, unbelievable. So respected on and off the ice um, would be what I say my dad's legacy is, not just by hockey people. Well, that's awesome. Bobby Hall yeah, go ahead. Me the other day. Bobby. Bobby Hall, yeah. Uh, a little emotional here. Mm. Um, you know, just he he's heard about Jimmy's passion. And, uh, you know, what a what a guy! What a what a tough to play against. So here's a you know a guy like Bobby Hall. I haven't spoken to Bobby in probably ten years. Mm. All that I know about Jimmy. Oh, yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. That's yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, 
Well, that's awesome to to be respected the way he was, the way he is, to hear from fans, players, executives. Um, obviously, your dad, uh, Vic, your teammate, was one of the great ones. And who knows, maybe one day they'll take a look back at his career and look at it differently and say he is deserving of being enshrined in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, what a great career. And I want to thank all of you, Vic Hadfield, Darcy, Dana, David. Thank you so much for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. It's been a wonderful conversation. As a Rangers fan, I, I feel very honored and privileged to have had this time with you all. And um, gosh, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Warren. We really appreciate you um, uh, reaching out to us and talking with us. It, it, it means a lot. So here we are once again, talking about a forgotten storm who many think is deserving of induction into his respective Hall of Fame. If you have listened to Sports Forgotten Heroes over the years, when I come across a player who many think is deserving of such an honor, I always say, I'm just telling the story and I don't really get into a debate on whether or not that player is deserving of such an honor. Well, I'm going to make an exception. When you consider all Jim Nielsen did to excel like he did despite the unusual way in which he was brought up, his background, the style of game he played, how difficult it was to get around him, the fact that the middle six years of his career, he was a plus 150. He helped Eddie Jacquemin and Gilles Villemure win the Vezina. He was a leader on a team that took the Bobby Orr-led Boston Bruins to six games in the 1972 Stanley Cup Finals. He was a huge part of the resurrection of the New York Rangers from doormat to Stanley Cup contender. There's so much. Yeah, he didn't score a lot of goals, but that wasn't his style of play. He was a stay-at-home defenseman who defined his position better than most and took care of the defensive zone. No, he wasn't flashy. No, he didn't score like Orr. Park, Coffee, and the high-scoring defensemen of the 80s and 90s? Should that preclude him from being enshrined? Heck no. There are so many players in all sports who didn't have the flashy numbers, yet they were inducted into the hall. I think it's about time that Jim Nielsen be inducted as well. For more on his accomplishments, go to my website, sportsfh.com. Again, that's sportsfh.com. I want to thank all of you for listening to today's podcast. Today's date is December 29th, 2020. So with that in mind, I hope all of you had a great holiday season and I wish everyone a happy new year. And I sure hope it's better than what we have all just gone through. Here's to a great 2021, and I'll see you next year on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! 
soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.